are looking at Edinburgh, whose stones enshrine a historic past. Yet, though they love tradition, the Scots are a progressive race. In wartime, as capital of Scotland, Edinburgh's hospitality is extended to warriors from many countries. A large number of the men who come to Britain to fight for the United Nations spend some of their well-earned leave in the beautiful Scottish city. You will find men from all over the free world in any of Edinburgh's service clubs today. Some are a second generation of fighters for freedom, whose fathers before them came to Scotland and saw the same famous skyline dominated for centuries by the castle built on a rock. It stands at one end of the high street. At the other, a mile away, is the palace of Holyrood House. Between the two stretches the famous thoroughfare called the Royal Mile. Don't fail to see the Royal Mile, writes the Canadian Scot to his son, now visiting the land of his forebears. Looking up from his letter across to the window, the young Canadian sees the castle. Coming out of the club into Princes Street, the Canadian Scot takes with him some of the friends he has made in the club, including a pole and a check, and they set off for the castle. Edinburgh Castle. It stands, as Robert Louis Stevenson says, a bass rock upon dry land rooted in a garden. Shaken by the passing trains, carrying a crown of battlements and turrets, and describing its warlike shadow over the liveliest and brightest thoroughfares of the new town. Edinburgh today seems to act as a magnet, drawing servicemen from all parts of Britain. Perhaps that is because, although Edinburgh has more connections with Europe than any other Scottish city, it is, at the same time, the heart of Scotland. From the entrance to the castle, our Canadian can look back along the Royal Mile of the High Street, described to him by his father. Holyrood, out of sight at the other end, is waiting for his inspection. But first he and his companions go into the castle, past the old arches and gateways that kept out the would-be attackers in medieval times, past the statues of Robert the Bruce and William Morris, who stand there, keeping guard upon the memories of the past, old fighters for freedom who have handed on their standards to these young men visiting the castle today. The castle guides, repeating their patter as they do, can always kindle the imagination with such material as theirs. Religion. The origin of the castle is lost in the mists of antiquity. That part which you are now looking at, King David's Tower, was built by David II, only son of Robert the Bruce. This grim fortress has withstood siege after siege. The castle rock reaches a height of 441 feet above sea level. Historians say that it was a fortress for primitive people long before 1000 BC. Passing the Argyle Battery, whose cannons commanded the entrance to the castle, the visitors come upon St. Margaret's Chapel. This is the oldest building in Edinburgh. Standing outside the chapel is Mons Meg, a siege gun built in 1486. The last time it was fired was in 1682 when it blew up. Near to Mons Meg is one of the queerest and smallest cemeteries in the world, where are buried the dogs of soldiers who were once garrisoned here. Many is the walk they've had in the Prince's Street they now overlook. We are now at the highest point of the rock, facing the palace of the kings and queens of Scotland. Many of Scotland's rulers have lived here, and none is so well remembered as Mary, Queen of Scots. It was here that she came for safety when hard pressed by her enemies. She occupied this room, and in a small room next to it, her son, James I of England, was born. During last century, when some workmen were repairing the wall of the palace, they discovered in it an oak coffin with the remains of an infant wrapped in cloth of gold just over the entrance to the Queen's apartments. Some people say it was the real James I, but we shall never know. Another grim story of the past is told about the banqueting hall at the palace. Here in 1440, the young Earl of Douglas and his brother were entertained to dinner. The last course was the head of a black bull, the symbol of death. This was a signal for them to be dragged away to a mock trial and summary execution. Aye, and they talk about the good old days. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I trust that my talk has been instructive and amusing. Before I leave you, I would like to draw your attention to the Scottish National War Memorial. The 
Scottish National War Memorial has been visited by millions from all over the world. It has an especial significance for soldiers of the United Nations, particularly when many of them come from countries which partly owe their existence to Scotland's sacrifices in the First World War. passing through the Czech soldier's mind. There is much in Edinburgh which reminds us of Prague. Both cities are rich in the traditions of the past. Jan Žiška and Wenceslas are revered in Prague for their patriotism. In Scotland, Robert the Bruce and William Wallace for the same reason. Not all of Edinburgh's history is in the castle. It is written in the stones of a street a mile long, a street that is indeed known as Scotland's Royal Mile a medieval city within a modern one, with a castle at one end and a palace at the other. It is the real heart of Scotland. Children play where once royal processions passed with pomp and circumstance, from the castle down the mile to Holyrood. This is the Lawn Market. The great Dr. Johnson stayed here with Boswell, and here lived Robert Burns. Behind this building, through the archway, is one of the many closes just off the Royal Mile. Their architecture is characteristic. The buildings around them seem to loom like medieval skyscrapers. Once they housed Scottish noblemen, now they are mostly working class homes. This is Riddle's Close. Riddle had a school here once. The children, so they say, didn't like him at all. So, following their bloodthirsty elders' example, they killed him. But of course, that was a long time ago, and like so many of the stories associated with the Royal Mile, history and legend are difficult to separate. Anyway, Scotland is more law-abiding nowadays, as witness the courts of session. The evolution of the Scottish legal system was by no means a peaceful business. How different the tranquility of Scottish life today compared with the past, when every Edinburgh tradesman had to carry arms, and at a moment's notice could be called upon to leave his shop to help quell civil disturbances or repel an invader from the city walls. You will find plenty of evidence of that on the library shelves within this building. Yes, Scotland's history proves that the Scots know what total war means. They were waging it through centuries of civil strife, invasion and attendant devastation. They knew as well as anyone what a return to the morality of the Dark Ages would mean. They've left all that where it belongs, in history books and pictures. From the courts of law to the courts of God is not a far cry in Edinburgh, and St Giles Cathedral surely stands for the new morality which Scotland has achieved and means to keep. The loyal citizens of Edinburgh put up this memorial to Charles II. One wonders whether Dewar John Knox, the great Protestant reformer, whose house is a little farther down the Royal Mile, would approve of this tribute to the Merry Monarch. Hard by, in Tweeddale Court, the first books were printed in Scotland in 1508, and now modern machinery clatters within the same old stone walls. But here, our Polish friend has something to say. Not all this is for Scotland. Many books and newspapers are printed here in Polish for the men and women of Poland's fighting forces. On this machine we print Wings, which is the journal of Polish Ironmen in this country. As we go down the Royal Mile from Tweeddale Court, we look towards the historic Cannon Gate. This is the toll booth, where wrongdoers were once imprisoned and the heads of traitors impaled. Close by lived Adam Smith, the great economist, author of The Wealth of Nations. He is buried in the graveyard of Old Canongate Church. When night falls on the Canongate, if you've a mind for such things, you'll think of the famous, the infamous and the unknown who rest here side by side in the Canongate graveyard.
They say that Rizzio, ill-fated secretary to Mary Queen of Scots, dies here. Does his spirit ever return to haunt the nearby palace of Holyrood? Does he ever revisit the audience chambers where on the night of the 9th of March 1566 he was brutally done to death? And does Mary's husband Darnley ever reenact his part in the drama of so long ago? when he came down the secret staircase connecting his room with the Queen's and with his band of conspirators surprised the unfortunate secretary, dragged him through her bedroom and murdered him before her eyes? Not all of Hollywood's memories are of strife. Here Bonnie Prince Charlie would enliven his brief stay at the palace with a ball for the ladies. Robert Louis Stevenson, who has described the castle so well, has apt words too for the palace. He writes, In a house of many memories, great people of yore, kings and queens, buffoons and grave ambassadors, played their stately farce for centuries. Wars have been plotted, dancing has lasted deep into the night. Murder has been done in its chambers. Adjoining the palace is the old abbey, whose associations go back to crusading times. It is said that from Palestine, crusaders brought back and deposited here a piece of the true cross, or Holy Rood. And it is from this that we get the name Holyrood Palace. Majestic in decay, the abbey witnesses the birth of a new spirit in Scotland. Today, Scotland marches in the battle for freedom, not by herself, but with the United Nations, not for herself, but for all men throughout the world. <laughs> 